So I'm just going to make a start on uh, mic number effects, which hopefully you, you guys actually will find useful for your coursework, I hope. I was hoping to go more on this one. <coughs> so let's talk about mic number effects. That's the next lecture. So uh, by way of recap, let's say the following. Okay, we all know that uh, if the density is constant, that's an incompressible flow, it's compressible <laughs> otherwise. Uh, if the Mach number is less than 0.3, we call that incompressible as well. That's uh, kind of a general rule in aviation. But if we go beyond that Mach number, then we must assume the flow is compressible, which means the density will change. It doesn't remain constant. Okay? In fact, if you go very high speed, supersonic and beyond, you will actually find that the density of the fluid can change quite a lot. And that's important. Of course, it has some physical effects as well. I think we all kind of know this. So let's talk about, remind you just very quickly, uh, Mach number regimes, what do I mean by this? So consider the flow at a point, uh, then by definition, the flow is called uh, subsonic. If the Mach number is less than one, of course, sonic is equal to one supersonic. And of course, there is hypersonic. There's no strict definition what hypersonic is, it's actually more to do with the flow physics, but usually <laughs> something like five and beyond is probably hypersonic, what we call the hypersonic. But anyway, I think hopefully you're all familiar with that, those definitions in terms of Mach number. The other things we can say are the following. Um, if we consider the, the flow field as a whole, the whole thing, we can say the following. Subsonic flow is uh, we, we, we call the whole flow field subsonic if the Mach number is less than one everywhere, okay? Beyond, before, the air, before the wing, or the aircraft, after the aircraft, the whole flow field you are considering is all subsonic. And in this case, what you guys will find, if you look at how flow properties like temperature, pressure, density, whatever, they will change smoothly and very, very little, okay? They, they don't change suddenly or... Uh, you know, they change continuously by small amounts. However, we can also get into something called the transonic region. What is the transonic region? That's just a mixed region with subsonic and some local supersonic flow. So in this case, the flow is, is, has typically two regions with one <coughs> subsonic M less than one and one supersonic M goes to two. When, this, when does this happen? If you guys think about your coursework, this really we ask you to run a, a calculation for Mach number close to one. I think between one and point eight. Anyway, near to one. Of course, what is near to one is yeah, uh, maybe from point seven to onwards. I would say. So yeah, if this is the case, then you might have. What, what we call transonic flow. So there could be regions that are subsonic and other regions that are supersonic. And because some regions could be supersonic, the first thing, of course, you guys think about is shock waves. So uh, that's what tells you the flow is supersonic. And we can have a case where everything is supersonic. So that's just the Mach number, very pristine Mach number, and around the domain you're interested in is all uh, supersonic. In that case, of course, you definitely have uh, shock waves. And what is interesting about shock waves is that uh, flow properties can change suddenly from one value to an extremely different value. And you have to keep track of those changes. And those changes mean something physically that uh, means something to the aircraft or the wing, whatever. But these are kind of descriptive, qualitative uh, you know, results that we need to think about. Going from subsonic to supersonic. Okay, so if I have, uh, let's say, a typical subsonic airfoil section that looks like this, and the free stream Mach number that's uh, uh, flowing through it, I guess, the fact that uh, the free stream Mach number is subsonic doesn't mean that there will have to be subsonic everywhere. As I've been telling you, there could be some regions, particularly on the top surface, that become suddenly uh, supersonic or locally supersonic. <coughs> so 
So we need to care about uh, that point. So let's just look, at, uh, just discuss these, these effects briefly that you might see as the flow is increased. Okay, so let's consider a case, for example, this is a typical subsonic airfoil, for example. Uh, let's say, in this case, the, unfortunately, I've changed it to infinity here, okay. It's the free stream Mach number. Let's say it's less than one. Uh, in this case, uh, for this shape, of course, you guys will have different airfoil shapes, so do not necessarily <coughs> expect the same results at the same Mach number for different airfoils. They could be slightly different. Well, they will be slightly different. But, for example, uh, as long as the Mach number for a typical subsonic airfoil section is less than 0.8, what we will find is that, uh, actually, the flow remains subsonic. It's, it's most likely that the flow remains subsonic all over the region of interest. Now, if, for example, we increase the Mach number, let's say between uh, the first case, for example, between 0.8 and 1. In this case, although the Mach number is less than one free stream on the around the airfoil, it could be slightly well, it could be completely different. So you might get the local Mach number on the top surface greater than one. That's supersonic flow locally. You can also get supersonic flow on the lower surface greater than one. And in both cases, you guys will have short waves. So this is a, a good example of uh, a transonic flow. If your Mach number is uh, between one and let's say 1.2, so it's still very close to Mach one. So this actually kind of a mixed region between transonic and supersonic. So in that case, what you might get is a, what we call a bow shock. So the bow shock is a shock wave which is a curved shock wave that actually confronts the wind. But what you guys will see is that once you have a, whatever you have a bow shock, the flow behind it is actually <coughs> soft. Okay. So it's very important to remember that. So if you have that, the flow is subsonic. So it was, super, let's say, close to one here, suddenly it's subsonic. Less than one. It becomes less than one because of the bow shock. The region, most of the region on the, the rest of the airfoil, you guys can see the local mic number is actually greater than one, so it's supersonic, and you may get shock waves towards the training edge like this. Increase the mic number further beyond, let's say, 1.2. Remember, this is just a generic example. It doesn't mean it has to be what you guys see in the course work. I'm just saying this is just a general example. Uh, as the mic number increases, now you don't get bow shock, you actually get oblique shock. Uh, for example, we have this, no, this is actually different. We have this is a wedge. Uh, for a wedge, you get uh, oblique shocks like this. The flow behind it is less than uh, the free stream, but it is still supersonic. So one of the main differences between bow shock and an oblique shock is bow shock, the flow is subsonic behind. Shock wave, oblique shock wave, the flow might, remain, might still be supersonic, but definitely less than the free stream because of the shock wave. This is why we say shock waves are very important. They change the flow quite a lot. You might get what we call this expansion waves. If you think about this, instead of a wedge being an airfoil, you can actually, also in an airfoil, you might, in some of your tests, you might see some expansion waves towards the back. So these are just kind of a collection of some of the things you guys might see in your runs. And uh, these are some of the Physic, uh, physics, I guess, you can see and really try to think about. But as I said, these are just general behavior. Doesn't mean this is exactly what you would see in your air for. One final slide and we'll stop. Uh, let's just talk about shock wave. So what's shock wave by definition is a very extremely thin layer of the, of the size of 10 to the minus five centimeters. Nonetheless, across this layer, very thin layer, the, the flow properties, they change drastically. Things like density, pressure, temperature. Uh, you can also think about shockwave as an explosive compression. This is exactly why once the aircraft goes through the sound barrier, you, you hear that bang. That's because of the shockwave. Um, and through the, through the shockwave, the pressure will increase. 
uh, quite discontinuously. So from a, whatever the number, the, the pressure was, to quite a different value of pressure. So maybe in one of your plots, if you look how the pressure, that if, you, if you plot a pressure plot around your wave or air pool, and you have a, a shock wave somewhere, hopefully you will see quite a marked difference between the pressure in front of the shock and the one after it. And of course it has to increase. Always the pressure increases across the shock wave. So this is one way to uh, kind of recognize you have shock wave, for example. More generally, uh, the pressure, density, temperature, and entropy. Now, I don't know, do you guys get entropy plots from CFS? You're the experts. Do you get entropy plots? Yes? Yes, okay. I don't know, to be honest, but you should be, actually. You can, I'm sure within the, uh, the equation uh, the, of, for energy, you can work out uh, an equation for entropy. So it should be possible. <laughs> anyway, one of the things you guys can remember about shockwaves is that pressure, density, temperature, and entropy across the shockwave, they all uh, in, uh, decrease. Oh, I said something wrong. They should increase here. Oh yeah, okay, that's fine. I thought it was going to decrease, sorry. So, th the ones in red, the reason I put in red, this means more, and the ones in blue, they go down. So. If you remember these general things when looking at your results, this is one of the way to spot you have a shockwave or not. And hopefully you see those effects <laughs> as well. Okay? So if you can confirm those effects through the shockwave, that's good. If something not quite right, you may not see those effects. But this is just to help you think about your coursework really as well. But these are the main points. I think because of time, and I, I know I have tutorial with one group, so... I'll see you guys next week.